The US is knee-deep in work on its sixth-generation fighter, the ANGAD or Next Generation Air Dominance Project. While we wait for more info on development of said plane, this video will cover perhaps an even more important aspect of the whole sixth-generation fighter jet idea. The Loyal Wingman fighter jet drones, or as the Pentagon likes to call them, collaborative combat aircraft. We'll analyze the Air Force's future drones and when they might start being fielded. We'll explore the recent US Air Force decision to down-select to two companies for the first generation of its drones with neither company being Northrop, Boeing nor Lockheed. Air combat drones are rushing ahead, coming into service sooner than you think. Unmanned wingman jets are poised to drastically change future air warfare, and near-future wars are simulated by today's sponsor, Conflict of Nations, in a world-spanning real-time strategy game. Here I can pick a game and a real country to lead. There are up to 128 players per game, depending on the game mode. I love being able to play the same match on my PC at work and continue via my phone at home. Honestly, if you get ganged up, matches can be meh, but there are also nail biters for world dominance as well, all for free. And while it is free to play, I usually go for the premium subscription pack, so I get build queues and rally points. Those make life a bit easier. Crucially, Binko viewers can get a premium subscription for a month on top of 13,000 gold as a gift. You just have to click the link in the video description before you take over the world. Stealth was the defining feature of the 5th generation fighter jets. For 6th generation fighters, the next buzzword requirement seems to be integration of loyal wingman drones to fighter jets. Right now, the US Air Force's fighter jet program, the ANGAD, is shaping up to be very expensive. In the words of Air Force's Secretary Frank Kendall, it will cost multiple hundreds of millions of dollars per plane. Kendall also said, quote, The Air Force has a nominal quantity of collaborative combat aircraft for planning purposes. The planning assumption is 1,000 CCAs. This figure was derived from an assumed two CCAs for each of the 200 ANGAD platforms and additional two for each of 300 F-35s, for a total of 1,000. End quote. That was said back in March 2023. So the sixth generation fighter is seemingly not gonna be that plentiful. For comparison, only 187 F-22s were ever made. The F-35 is gonna be more plentiful. The US inventory is probably around 700 planes right now, but the ultimate goal of 2400 to be procured is still looking possible. Also, the figure of 1000 CCAs is preliminary. Kendall himself said the actual final figure could be twice as many. But such decisions won't be made for years and may keep changing with the changes in the geopolitics. Before we go on to answer an important question, what is a CCA? CCA is an unmanned fighter jet. It has a jet engine, wings and it carries fuel. Some designs may have some stealth features and may carry some weapons inside to maintain stealth. It also has sensors which, like the weapons, can be swapped out between missions. Basically, several CCAs can fly alongside manned fighter jets, but not all would be the same. Some would work as sensor nodes, others would carry weapons, some may act as radar jammers. That description is fairly vague, but it draws upon existing quotes from Pentagon officials. It's very likely the route the Air Force will follow. Also, much is being invested in autonomy, the AI brain of the drone. But that can go only so far. It seems no one is confident enough in current and near-future AI capabilities to simply cut out the ANGAD man fighter. The AI inside the drones may be good, but it seems it will mostly deal with quick reactions and operational interpretations of tactical decisions coming from the controlling planes. Basically, the AI is expected to be good enough to try to evade enemy missiles on its own, good enough to fly from point A to point B, while evading collisions and minimizing its exposure to the enemy. Good enough to prioritize its sensors and maybe even to fire weapons in self-defense. But not good enough to go far out into enemy territory, to search for targets on its own, to identify targets and to decide whether to engage them, how to engage them, and so on. All that may change in the coming decades, but for now the Air Force seems to be playing it safe with incremental development of its CCAs. 
So that's why control is important. But why do it from nearby fighters and not from far away? Drones like the Reaper and such are usually controlled via satellite, which means the input signal travels quite a bit around the Earth than back to get feedback. That takes roughly a second, which may not seem like a lot, but in combat that can be an eternity. Additional issue is that such communication involves wide beams, which means it's fairly detectable, and can be more easily jammed. A US DoD explored narrower beam satellite comms but those two still resulted in 600 mile radius spots. Against a peer opponent, such wide spots can still be exploited. So what the Air Force needs is a way to communicate using very narrow beams, which are inherently harder to detect and thus harder to interfere with, and it needs the latency to be almost non-existent, meaning the actual control input happens fairly close to the drone. While communication signals coming from above, from satellites, can be safer from jamming than ones coming from roughly the same altitude as the CCA is at, proximity to the CCA can also help protect the signal, as signal wavelength over very short distances can be such that it's harder to pick up by the enemy. All that points to a need to fly the plane issuing commands to the CCA right at the combat zone so not 300 miles away in some sort of AWACS-like command center, but more like 50 miles away, which means such control aircraft are bound to get shot at as well. It can't be a big AWACS-like plane, it needs to be a proper combat plane to survive, hence the ANGAD fighter being the platform which will issue commands. Now, how often will those CCAs need input? Well, said info isn't available, but it's curious that even F-35s were mentioned as being able to control CCAs. F-35s famously do not come in two-seater versions, so a single pilot will both have to pilot their own plane, manage their own systems and manage two or more CCAs. This April, Kendall said two to five CCAs may be acquired for every fighter. That doesn't necessarily mean so many would be flown in missions, but it does point towards future plans and needs. Kendall also said the Air Force doesn't plan to have CCAs for every single fighter, at least not initially, which also points towards future plans. Kendall did at times mention that more CCAs could be coupled with every manned fighter. Major General Scott Job, Director of Force Design Integration and Wargaming, said they tested former pilots in F-22 simulators and they were comfortably managing up to six CCAs. The Collaborative Combat Aircraft Competition is quite new. Officially, five contender companies were awarded development contracts early this year, but the competition has been announced in 2022, back when the CCA program was a black program, shrouded in secrecy. Who knows how many years it was developed before that. Certainly, loyal wingman concepts were at times mentioned even two decades earlier. That being said, Official contracting is done at a breakneck pace, signaling Air Force's urgency. The really interesting bit is this. In January 2024, the US Air Force awarded contracts to Boeing, General Atomics, Lockheed Martin, Anduril, and Northrop Grumman. Three out of five are big names, big players who make all the US combat jets. One, General Atomics, is a known drone maker, which makes the Reaper drone, for example. But it doesn't make fighter jets. And one, Anduril, is a very new company, founded in 2017, with little experience. Then in April, mere months later, a downselect happened, and the US Air Force eliminated all but two companies, the companies still in the game, General Atomics and Anduril. Not a single of the big players remains in the competition. That's really unprecedented in a way, but it also suggests where Air Force's priorities lie and it may help us understand what sort of CCA the US is going for. It also has to be said that CCA is a continuous development effort for the Air Force. The contracts that General Atomics and Anduril got are for Increment 1 effort. The goal of Increment 1 is to test the whole idea, not just if the plane works, but if many planes can be built quickly. The idea behind many recent programs, not just CCAs, but missile production, various other drones, is to quickly ramp up production and have hundreds of aircraft made per year if needed. Incremental development idea is also not very new. At first, even the whole ANGAD plane was supposed to be done via incremental design improvements. 
that seems to have not worked out. A big 6th generation plane is not a design that can be redone every several years, but with missiles and CCAs that's still being attempted. So increment 1 is not gonna be very demanding. It's gonna have some autonomy, but not too much. Air Force Acquisition Executive Andrew Hunter said autonomy is the hardest part of CCAs, and that increment 1 will have a useful degree of autonomy, though not as much as originally thought. Hunter added that later increments will have greater autonomy, but that the focus of increment 1 is achieving the quickest route to mass production. That is why Andrew and General Atomics beat the others. Increment 1 is also not gonna be big. It may not have a lot of range or carry lots of weapons, and it seems it will be subsonic. The winning design decision is planned for 2026, but Air Force Secretary Kendall said the Air Force might decide to build two separate designs from both contenders, if it can afford to do so. Kendall added that increments are planned to be done two years apart. Increment 1 is meant to go into production quickly, within a few years, and that first deliveries will happen within five or so years. Specifically, the in-service date for Increment 1 is planned for 2028. CCAs will have a common airframe and modular mission equipment, all optimized against an expected threat set. Kendall further explained that mission payloads will be swappable, depending on mission requirements. He also said that fielding CCAs will not come at the expense of manned fighters, but that CCAs will enable them to be more capable. CCAs will be independent platforms carrying weapons and sensors. What that means is that the Air Force will deploy more missiles and more sensors in the same airspace at the same time, compared to today's capabilities. While previously $40 million per CCA was the expected inferred cost, lately different figures were mentioned. Kendall said CCA costs will top out at 25 to 30 million, that's the upper range. Earlier, Kendall mentioned that the lower range could be just one-fourth of F-35's cost, meaning 20 million dollars. Some hundred CCAs are currently planned to be built by 2029. Ramping up to a thousand should happen at a greater pace, possibly by mid-2030s. Interestingly, Air Force officials said that the Air Force started off with expecting an exquisite high-end stealthy platform. But then war game simulations were done and the service went back to the drawing board. The results of the simulations showed that in the Pacific, large number of cheaper CCAs were more valuable than a small number of high-end drones. Indeed, at one time, Air Force had suggested CCAs might cost half the F-35's price, $40 million. But then those cost figures have since dropped, possibly after those war games. Two designs have been chosen, as said. One is based on General Atomic's XQ-67A. That aircraft had its first test flight only this February. General Atomic's president David Alexander said that aircraft is largely the same as the design submitted for the CCA Increment 1. It shares the same structure, though there has been a slight change to the wing slope. Alexander, perhaps bravely, said the following, quote, This is in our wheelhouse, we are the best in the world at it, end quote. He also said his company's design should be better than the Air Force's requirement, and that General Atomics can improve upon Air Force's schedule requirements, delivering aircraft in perhaps half the time of the requirement. Now, final design may change a little during development, but considering the aggressive development timetable, it's likely we will indeed see drones very similar to the proposed prototypes. The XQ-67 looks to be fairly compact. Dimensions weren't disclosed, but sizing the plane to the runway with at Palmdale Airfield, where it was tested, Roughly 44 feet looks plausible for its wingspan. 33 to 34 feet looks like a plausible length, minus the nose pitot tube. Those dimensions may seem as if they're not that much smaller than an F-16 or an F-35, but weight-wise, it's a whole different class of a plane. The F-35 doesn't look a lot bigger than the F-16, but it is. It is over 40% heavier. Comparing the XQ-67 with other small aircraft and interpolating its weight, one might get an empty weight of some 2 tons, give or take, meaning 6 times lighter than an F-35. Things like speed, range, payload and such are much harder to estimate, but for supersonic speeds the plane's wings would look different. Plus the competitor's Andrew's design was officially cited to be subsonic. 
it's thus extremely likely General Atomic's design is subsonic as well. Again, one can use Kratos' Valkyrie figures to get some semblance of performance. So besides a Mach 0.9 speed and decent 45,000 feet ceiling, which are within the average cruise speed and ceiling of fighter jets, one thing that does stand out is range. If the General Atomic's design is anything close to the 3,000 nautical miles of the Kratos Valkyrie, it will be quite a long-legged drone. That's little over 3,400 miles, and almost surely refers to ferry range. F-16, for example, tops out at 2,400 miles. F-35's ferry range is unknown, but it could plausibly be around 2,000 miles. Then again, range could be closer to Boeing's Ghost Bad jet drone, which is credited with 2,300 miles. Given the size, its plausible General Atomics offering might have more room than its competitor, perhaps enough for three or four AMRAAM-sized missiles, or for two compact air-to-ground missiles, perhaps like the SIAW. The other competitor, Anduril, is fascinating and has an interesting approach to the drone, which seems to have piqued Air Force's interest. Anduril is a very young company, seen as a disruptor to the established military-industrial complex companies. Its founders are of SpaceX and Palantir heritage. SpaceX already disrupted the established space launch businesses. While Palantir is a new player in the new field of big data analytics, which can be crucial in AI development. In a span of just a few years, Anduril managed to secure contracts with the Pentagon for surveillance projects, software and drones, like the small Altius and Anvil drones, as well as a very novel Roadrunner drone-like SAM missile. It seems to specialize in very low-cost drones. Anduril also has an AI-related contract with the Pentagon, the Project Maven, which deals with battlefield target recognition. Anduril seems well-connected in the Pentagon, to be able to do all that so quickly. But crucially, now it entered the CCA game out of nowhere. In September 2023, Anduril bought Blue Force Technologies, a smaller company which had made a cheap adversary training drone, Fury. Such drones help simulate opponents in real-world training flights on the cheap. So Anduril, lacking expertise and time to make such a drone from scratch, bought Fury, retained the name and retooled the project to serve as not only an adversary training drone, but also as a CCA. Anduril executive Palmer Lucky said they're bringing Anduril's work on autonomy and communications to the Fury. Given the tight deadlines, it's improbable large changes are being done to the shape and size of the Fury. Back when it was just an adversary aircraft, it was described as a 17 by 20 feet plane a Mach 0.95 plane able to do 9G instantaneous turns. It's possible that the plan is not to have Anduril's Fury to carry internal weapons at all, but to have it fire its AMRAMs for rail launchers under its wings. Bottom line is, Fury seems to be a low-cost and low-capability counterpart to General Atomic's design. Its stealth shaping is minimal, which makes sense coupled with external missile carriage. It's a visibly smaller plane, and two AMRAMs per drone seem plausible. To another drone design similar to Fury from Blue Force did feature four AMRAMs and a different tail section. Who knows what design Anduril will ultimately choose. Anduril's CCA seems to be aiming for an even lower bar than General Atomics, but that may be exactly what the Air Force is also exploring. Remember when we said Air Force is pondering giving contracts to both competitors? It implies the Air Force wants to see how both concepts would work in the real world, ideally. It already has wargaming simulations suggesting cheap and plentiful drones are the way to go. So it may come down to money available. Anduril's CCA may be more easily produced in large numbers, quickly. A General Atomics drone may be a bit less numerous, but we're still talking about the cheap aircraft. For now, stealth is not part of the CCA equation much. For future increment CCAs, who knows? The Air Force said that any company, even the ones who lost the Increment 1 competition, can recompete for Increment 2 on their own dime, which may be problematic for those relying on government money. But on the other hand, Kratos Aerospace, which makes the Valkyrie drone and is considered a small player compared to Boeing or Lockheed Martin, already announced they will compete for Increment 2. Major General Scott Job also said that Increment 2 is a clean sheet of paper design, and that it has been described as a more exquisite platform than Increment 1. 
possibly to include greater stealth and better sensors. The Air Force is still weighing its options and waiting to see what the industry can offer. Job said that multiple versions of the drones could exist, one a high-end platform and other variants which are less expensive. Some could even be single-purpose designs. Andrew Hunter said that Increment 2 could have very different requirements from Increment 1, and that the Air Force is still at the beginning of the Increment 2 process. Air Force officials said Increment 2 contracts should be awarded by 2026, but the requirements have not yet been defined. Just how cheap those planes will be, not even the Air Force knows that. General Job also said that the Air Force no longer considers CCAs to be attritable or expendable, and that the operational commanders will be given freedom to decide whether to use CCAs as if they're expendable platforms. Increment 1 will give the Air Force some operational capability, and through it the Air Force expects to learn a lot. Increment 2 is also expected to profit from international cooperation. For example, the Anglo-Japanese GCAP 6th generation plane has loyal wingmen planned. The Japanese have explicitly said they expect those to be developed in cooperation with the US. Whatever future increments bring, they will be more lethal as autonomy progresses, maybe by increment 5, will indeed be in the era of fully robotic exquisite drones, which will by and large replace manned fighter jets. Before we go a bit more on Conflict of Nations, the free online PvP strategy game of global proportions. I love modern warfare stuff, so it's right up my alley. There are modern tanks, jets, missile systems, as well as nuke subs and nuclear weapons simulated in-game. Even unmanned combat aircraft, like in our video. Economy management is part of the strategy, to be sure. There are provinces to upkeep, and you manage their morale and build facilities. Taking strategic resources from other players is a must, let me tell you. Otherwise, you may have to pay higher rates at the resource market. And the best way to do that is to find good allies. Conflict of Nations has a robust diplomacy and alliance system. In the end, hey, it's whatever helps me conquer the world. Just remember to click that link below the video to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.